Sadashiva Samarambam, Shankara Sharya Madhyamam, Asmada Sharya Pariantam, Vande Guru Param Param, Ishvaro Guratmeti, Muchi Veda Vibhagine, Yoma Vda Vyapta Dehaya, Takshina Murta Yena Maha, Tava Vedanta Sedanta, Gocharam Tamagocharam, Govindam Paramanandam, Tati Guru Pranatosh Maham, Om. Om Shanti 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 Om. Namaste. Welcome everyone. And we we giving we giving continuity to our Viveka Chudamani for you. Uh, Michael, did you get the opportunity to look into any one of the videos that I, that were there in the YouTube? Uh, which videos are you referring to? Yeah, uh, the ones uh, of this series of Viveka Chudamani. You, 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 you haven't watched any one before this one, right? Um, oh, no, I'll, no, I see what you mean. No, I haven't seen those yet. Okay, not a problem. So we are, we are entering the verse number seven, which is uh, something a little bit related to the questions you have been asked me, uh, Michael. This verse seven of this text, which by the way is a, a kind of an advanced text, it, uh, it, it covers the subject called qualifications. So in Vedanta, Vedanta basically is the only uh, spiritual religious structure that that says up front that for self-knowledge and moksha or liberation uh, we need a means of knowledge and the means of, a lot of knowledge alone are not sufficient for the person to attain one's freedom or self-knowledge or liberation or moksha or whatsoever we want to call it or enlightenment and it says, we say up front that uh, in order for the means of knowledge, knowledge to work, the person also has to have certain qualifications developed. <clears throat> this verse number seven is the one about the qualifications. Okay? They are qualifications for self-knowledge. The verse seven says, qualifications are required for self-knowledge. Time, place, and circumstance are auxiliary means. So what it means? So as I was saying before, it means that uh, fortunately or unfortunately, howsoever we want to put it, you know, we need to be qualified. Okay? Because uh, if, if self-knowledge and moksha would be available for anybody, and then we would would be living in a in a kind of structure that uh, is not properly structured, is not properly ordered, because everything here depends on on cause and effect system. That's all based on on qualifications, all based on on people doing certain things to gain certain desert, uh, <coughs> results. And the results we mean by qualifications is a pure mind, a refined mind, a contemplated mind. Excuse me for a moment. <clears throat> so when we come to Vedanta, we say, okay, everybody wants this, this so-called enlightenment, but in order for us to enjoy and appreciate self-knowledge and, and the sense of freedom that comes with it, we need to have our qualifications in place. We need to develop our mind, our mental uh, personality to the extent that uh, we can follow the logic of Vedanta and, uh, and gradually understand the true nature of, of the self, the true nature of the I. No? So this is the good news. Because otherwise it would be like something like a lottery. Anybody could just say, oh, okay, I heard it, I got it. So 
And we often say as well, if you hear and if you get it, and then you may be in that kind of, of category of people that gets it, but then ungets it. And why people get and ungets it? They ungets it because their mind is not really qualified to really retain this knowledge, retain and, and integrate and internalize this knowledge once for all, <clears throat> gradually. So this verse shifts our attention from the means of knowledge before we talk about Vedanta as a means of knowledge. So now our attention is shifting from the means of knowledge to the qualifications required for an individual to assimilate this knowledge. Okay, so we have the knowledge, we have a means of, we have a means of knowledge, huh? ego, which is self-knowledge and moksha. But then we say, well, before we get there, we need to develop qualifications. And the reason I'm, I'm elaborating a little bit more on this is because this verse, this text is a text that does not cover Kami Yoga and Dhamma Yoga. Kami Yoga, Dhamma Yoga, Upasana Yoga that are the yogas that uh, allows us to prepare and refine and, and purify the mind. Huh? So this text, it begins on the assumption that we are all qualified people, but it's okay. Well, we can go by and by, and I may, I may just come and I, I take some diversions just to introduce a little bit of the concepts, concepts of, of the yogas that helps us to develop whatsoever qualifications we're still lacking. This, the, the, the intention of this verse is to remind us that uh, time and place, what is time and place, and all these external circumstances. What are external circumstances? Oh, I want my cushion, I want my incense, I want it to, to do my, my sadhana from 7 to 8 in the morning or from 5 to 6, you know, it's the best time. So if we are too much attached to this exterior kind of, external kind of circumstance and setups, you know, and then we begin missing the point because those are auxiliary factors. The main factor is the development of our qualifications. So we need to have these qualifications properly developed and, and in place for us. This is the most important requirement not the, the conditions and the kind of uh, place and time and so on that we, we do our sadhanas. No? It is characteristic of Vedanta that it begins each teaching by distinguishing that which will lead us to knowledge from that which will not. So we always present the fact that Self-knowledge is a gradual process unless one is so highly qualified that it just becomes clear right on the spot, which is very rare. Otherwise, it's a gradual process. And it, in this process, we make it clear what promotes our spiritual growth and what obstructs our spiritual growth. Whatsoever actions, such sadness and lifestyle I do that is conducive to my mental preparedness, the development, and whatever I do that is going to obstruct my growth. You know? So we always present that we need to really look into that to understand what we are doing with our life, if we are living our life in, a, in harmony, in conformity, which it's my goal, provide my goal is the highest goal there is, which is self-knowledge and moksha. <clears throat> so this verse tells us that external circumstances sound helpful, do not themselves produce self-knowledge, does not themselves produce moksha. It does not mean to say that uh, it's not helpful because as we know, we often say, <laughs> we need to also work on the external factors. We need to somehow organize our life in a way that we have a lifestyle that helps to accomplish our goal, not to develop our mental 
refinement and purification. It's not that none of that has value. It has value. But what we are saying here, the most important value are the qualification. But guess, guess what? In order for us to develop these qualifications, we also need to deal with, with find proper conditions, circumstance, timing, and lifestyle, and so on. Those are also important. But you never get knowledge by external factors alone. Huh? That's the point here. The verse intends to say one, that perfect timing early in the morning before sunrise or whatever, or late in the afternoon, or perfect, perfect location, like, uh, oh, no, I, I, I will get enlightened only if I find a place, you know, in the woods, in nature, near the sea, you know, when there is a perfect silence, a perfect peace. <clears throat> in the old days, I used, <clears throat> I used to believe that uh, I could not do this work in the West. I was, I was hooked to the idea of being in India as, as the most important factor, you know, for my enlightenment. So I used to think, no, the only way is to be in India. I cannot live in the West. I used to come to the West and want to run back. And then one time I came and I got stuck, trapped in the West. And then I thought, finito, I can never get enlightened or anything because now I'm trapped in the West. And the most important thing is to be in India because this happens only for people in India. <clears throat> no, it's not that. It's our qualifications, it, it's our mind, the, the condition of our mind, the, the, the thirst, the, 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 hunger, the anger, the hunger we have for self-knowledge and motion. Our burning... <clears throat> So if we become too much attached to these routines and environments, so we miss the point. You know? and, uh, and people go to the extent that they have to, to live kind of new age lifestyle full of crystals and full of, you know, wearing only certain, certain, certain colors and a certain fabric. And, you know, the people, a lot of the time, they get lost with things that are the least possible, relevant, you know, so we need to keep our mind in that which is the most relevant. <clears throat> the verse stress the predisposition required to receive the teachings. Without this preparedness, the means of knowledge may not work or will not work or will work but will not produce self-knowledge and moksha. Because as we often say, knowledge is the greatest purifier there is. We hear that over and over in different texts and scriptures. But don't just knowledge is the greatest purifier there is. But it does not mean that one who is not really prepared is going to get moksha, but it can it can get get great development, great purification, refinement, you know, great spiritual growth, because when we are really applying this knowledge, submitting our minds to this means of knowledge, our ignorance is constantly being attacked, literally attacked. Sometimes it feels uncomfortable, but we are, we are under attack. Our ignorance is under attack. And although the ignorance is very deeply rooted in our causal bodies, but it's still these attacks we receive does some damage even to the ignorance seated in the causal body. So there is a lot of value in terms of mental preparedness, mental purification by, by the application of this knowledge, by Shravana, Manana, and Dijijasana. It's a great purifier. <clears throat> but this verse stressed the, the predisposition to receive this teaching in order to gain moksha without this preparedness the means of knowledge cannot work will not work in this case the fault will not be in the teaching or the teacher the fault will be in lack of qualifications of the student and this is the most difficult part because uh, 
most people they they prefer to blame Vedanta or to blame any means means of knowledge, you know, as, as not valid, not proper. Because people people's egos somehow wants to protect their self-image. No, no, I mean I don't buy into these things that I need to get mental <clears throat> purification and preparation, you know. I mean I want something and I want something in a short period of time. You know, I want instant or, or, or very, very short-term results here. I don't want to, I don't buy into this notion that I need to grow, develop qualifications, do sadhana, you know, and then grow more. And then maybe after five, 10, 15 years, I get my realization. No, I mean, I don't have time for it. Who has time for that? Most people look at, at the accomplishment of moksha as, as a, a, an accomplished like any other. No, I, I go and I get it. I want to do it. And I can do so many other things, you know. I know this requires a mind that is very, very rare to find. You know, and that's what we're going to look today. So the fault in this case would not be in the teaching or in the teacher, but in the lack of qualifications of the student. <clears throat> we may say that Vedanta does not work for us and that we prefer another means of knowledge for realizing the self. But guess what? Vedanta is the best means of knowledge to realize the self, the most complete, the most sophisticated, the most extensive and comprehensive and so on the most elegant, okay? Oh, no, no, I want to get enlightenment and I, I'm just going to follow my heart. I'm, I'm a bhakta, okay? So we are all bhaktas. We all have devotion. We all have love for what we love. But unfortunately or fortunately, moksha is possible only when we develop a love for knowledge. And when we say knowledge in Vedanta, we mean self-knowledge, knowledge of the true nature of the I the true nature of the self, the true nature of reality. So Vedanta, the text says that is the only means of knowledge available. So I prefer to say it's, it's the best means of knowledge available. So if you don't get it with Vedanta, which, which somehow presents a teaching that addresses ignorance for all possible angles, Okay, so if we don't get it from Vedanta, so it's it's not much probable that we, we get it from small bits and pieces of knowledge mixed up with some some people's interpretations and experience here and there in the spiritual world, you know. If we you know having the entire body of knowledge at your disposal, you still say no, 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 thank you. I, it's too it's too much work. You know, I, I just go over there because there there is somebody saying that I can get a very, very, very quick result. You know, I just have to understand it in a single moment and that's it. No, if you don't get it with Vedanta, it means you are not really qualified for self-knowledge and uh, it's chances are you are not going to get it anywhere else. If Vedanta is not working for us, that can only mean that we are not yet fully qualified, that we need to requalify. <clears throat> this notion of requalify is interesting. Uh, if I remember well, Dayananda introduced this idea. It's a sort of uh, an, a different way to present the concept of Nididhyasana. Nididhyasana is, is a constant application of this knowledge on your mind on a daily basis. And sometimes if we are not really getting the fruits of this, this sadhana. No, we are, we are not getting the full benefit of this sadhana. And then we may say like, okay, in this case, it's better step back a little bit, you know, back off a little bit and start starting applying the knowledge, the dental knowledge, but from of karma and dharma yoga. Because by doing so, by doing so, we, we requalify, we, we develop even more yeah, our qualifications. That's the idea. 
So if that's the case, it's better we accept like, oh no, I, there are some qualifications missing and I need to do some, some other work right now rather than stay all the time, only focus on the yana yoga aspect of Vedanta, you know? I am Brahman, I am consciousness, and this is all good. This is all good. But if the mind is too rajasic and too tamasic, this knowledge does not really do the entire job it is designed to do. Because the mind is either down, you know, down, or it's a little bit too agitated, excited, you know, <clears throat> stressed. Knowledge is, is, is less probable, you know, to be assimilated because an agitated mind somehow is scattered is pay attention now and then another thought coming and then push the, the scripture attention and then another thought come another thought. When you see you have all these bits and pieces you know, with a lot of other thoughts that came in between. And then what happened? We have to listen to the same or read the same text 10, 100 times so that we can join the piece, you know? And yet, even when we have the full picture, if the mind is going all over the place, still it's going to be getting attached to all kinds of, of objects, you know, other objects of experience. Oh, yeah, you know, but I want this, I want that, because the mind is still extroverted. It's not really focused. It did not develop this ability to, to focus all the logic of the scripture, to develop the understanding in the value for this means of knowledge, okay? So that it can really value and stay with it for a length of time, a length of quality time, quality time, not like, you know? Some people, they, they like to study Vedanta, but they study Vedanta doing many things. I know some of my people, my friends, my students in Brazil, they like audios, they don't even like video. If the person is too registered, the person does not like videos because videos implies that people have to sit. They work the file to audio and then they, they go jogging, they go to the gym, they cook, you know. So it's better than nothing. So I don't discourage them to, from doing that. But I tell them, so you're going to have to listen to the teaching several times to, to put together the piece slowly, slowly, you know, because the mind holds one thought at the time. If you are cooking, if you are doing this and doing that, so your attention is wide, is scattered, you know, it's like. Verse number eight. <clears throat> it's interesting that this, this text, it hammers, especially in the beginning here, hammers on this relationship between between the scripture the teacher and the student and it keeps presenting things you know in, in its own <clears throat> relationship you know so that people understand that each one of factors are absolutely necessary and important if you pull any one of those there is no moksha or self-knowledge being you know being gained. So without the presence of a qualified teacher, self-knowledge will not take place. You know? Again, I would prefer to say self-knowledge will probably not take place without the presence of a qualified teacher. But if the individual is highly qualified, so self-knowledge may take place even without the presence of a qualified teacher. Four qualifications are enumerated by those great teachers who have realized the self and attained the vision of non-duality as revealed by the scriptures of Vedanta. So there are four fundamental qualifications. I know that this qualification, they can be, they can be unfolded in like in 10, 12, 20, 30, in some texts, they show even 30 qualifications. Okay? So without the presence of a qualified teacher, self-knowledge will not take place. Four qualifications are enumerated. 
by those great teachers who have realized the self and attained the vision of non-duality as revealed by the scriptures. So these qualifications, they are not arbitrary kind of qualifications. Like you say, okay, now let's make it, Shwara comes and say, let's make it difficult. So let's say like uh, in order to come to the Vedanta club, you have to have this, all these degrees and qualifications and, and you know. No, it's not like that. It's not that we are Vedanta or Ishwar is trying to filter to say, no, no, we want only very few people to have self-knowledge because this is like, it's like that secret thing, you don't know? It's that knowledge that cannot be given easily. You know, it's like, a, it's almost like hidden knowledge. No, the knowledge is open and available to all. But, uh, at the same time, we know that qualifications are uh, required, and these qualifications are just common sense, common sense, common sense <coughs> observation by these yonis, by these self-realized people from, from thousands of years. They understood that some people, certain number of people, begin this, this search now into, into self-discovery and to understand one's, one's true nature. You know, what, what is this light of consciousness shining in my mind? So I want to, to, to look into this. I know, I, I mean, I can't look into this because my eyes and my other sense organs, they are extroverted, but yet I have this obsession. And then people start closing their eyes to see if the, the eye was something interior that by closing my eyes and so so we have been doing meditation doing all kinds of attempts to understand something that is not available you know through perception and inference so everybody who succeeded in this inquiry in this investigation of the nature of one's own true nature identity Later on, could come up and say, yes, so why? And uh, let's share, because the first impulse most people have is like, so let's share, because uh, this is the root cause of all suffering and all destruction that we see in the world. So let's share it. It's a, it's a very genuine you know, impulse that we all have. And then as they start sharing, they say, see, why some people... They, they seem to want this knowledge, but uh, they are far from understanding it, you know? And why some people are trying for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and yet they are not understanding it? Why somebody who just came after a few months or a few years got it, you know? So they're looking, and then they start seeing that everybody who, who understood who they are, their fundamental, essential, free, independent self, nature, people they somehow they had they had they had some some mental emotional qualities to themselves and then they start just finding this common factor among all these people who were getting and also observing the people who were not getting it and they say of course look at the person the person is is too depressed the person is too stressed out the person is too ambitious you know it's easy it's common sense you know you observe who, who succeeded, who did not succeed, and then you please easily draw the conclusion that these and these and these were the common factors among people who got it. That's the idea of the qualifications. And of course, in the spiritual world, nobody says that. Why? Because it chases people away. <clears throat> when you say that qualifications are required, most people in the spiritual world they walk away and say, what are you talking about? You know, I'm a free citizen of the United States of America and I have the right to get what I want. I want enlightenment now. And who are you to tell me that I'm not qualified, right? So <clears throat> that's, uh, that does not sell. So therefore all these independent philosophies, these independent kind of schools or, or teachers or teachings, they, they somehow, they, they hide the fact. Some of them, I, my, I suspect that they know, but it's not good for business. So 
So therefore, they just they hide the fact that qualifications are necessary. You know, so people like Rajneesh would say, "I accept everybody." Why? He would say, "You know what was his logic?" <clears throat> you say, "No. If God has created you, who am I to not accept you?" So if God has created all of you, who am I to say no? You you cannot be my disciple <clears throat> because you are you are not good enough. But God created everybody, you know, because God creates by the means of ignorance. Ignorance is what keeps popping up, you know, bringing up jivas all over, again and again, over and over, forever, beginninglessly. So that is the byproduct of ignorance. Now, to come out of this maya, of this ignorance, it, uh, it's not a simple job, you know. It's not a simple job. If a teacher wants, wants to be really honest and straightforward, not to waste his time and the time of other people, better say that up front instead of saying, oh, come, everybody come, you know? I'm going to enlighten all of you and so on. The text will soon begin to provide a detailed description of the four prerequisites or self-knowledge, but it first tells us that these means are prescribed by those who have seen the truth contained in the, contained in the words of the Upanishads. <laughs> this may be appropriate place to make the distinction between philosophy and Vedanta. So before we enter the qualifications, we look into the difference between philosophy and Vedanta. Vedanta, we say it's a teaching tool, a teaching methodology. Okay? It's a body of knowledge. It's a means of knowledge. It's a means to get a certain knowledge. For any knowledge to take place, we need a means of knowledge. If we want to be a medical doctor, we have to go to the college, go to the university, and stay there for 5, 10, 15 years until we get enough education so that we can exercise that kind of knowledge, that kind of profession. So any knowledge, any objective knowledge requires a means of knowledge. But people, when they come to the spiritual world, they often think like, oh, but uh, not spirituality, not enlightenment, not self-knowledge. So self-knowledge, you don't need a means of knowledge because means of knowledge is something mental, intellectual, and so on. So I want some, some, some mystical kind of experience. I want some transmission. I want some shakti that brings about what we often hear as awakening. You know, oh, I woke up. No? So people think on those terms when they come to spirituality. But guess what? Enlightenment, technically speaking, was never described as self-experience, but it has always been described as self-knowledge. So it's said to be self-knowledge because it's all about knowledge. It's not about an experience, but it's a knowledge of something that cannot be objectified. No? That the mind and the sense organs cannot reach and, and objectify the self. The self is something that cannot be reduced to an object. And this again is good news. Because any object, anything that can be objectified, reduced to the status of an object, we know that is bound by time. It's, it changed, it has a beginning, a middle, an end. Everything that can be objectified, it's somehow it's bound by time. So there is only one principle that's not bound by time. And this is I, my conscious, limitless existence. <clears throat> so the self is that which is the, not the, the, the object of knowledge of every human being 
searching or seeking moksha. So our object of knowledge is the self. And in order to gain this knowledge, to assimilate it clearly, we need a means of knowledge. And Vedanta is a means of knowledge. And this means of knowledge is all based on logic. It's not based on mysticism. It's not based on any of these vague, mysterious, mystical kinds of esoteric science. It's based on pure logic. And it's a logic that is extracted from our experience of life, which we have not properly examined before. So it helps us. You know, these are revealed, revealed knowledge that helps us to look again and re-examine our experience of knowledge under the light of this teaching so that we can come and follow and then come to the same conclusion as the rich, as everybody who has benefited by, was benefited by this means of knowledge. So it has nothing to do with philosophy. <clears throat> philosophy is something that is usually very speculative, very vague. You know, it's, it's, it's not about Vedanta. In the West, philosophy has developed into an academic discipline in which the nature of objects, notions, and ideas are objectified. And how they are perceived is debated by contending schools of thoughts. So there, is one, there are some aspects of Vedanta that even some of our Swamis refer as philosophical aspects of Vedanta. When we, when we listen to Paramartananda and Dayananda here and there, they, they talk about some aspects of Vedanta that they call the philosophical side of Vedanta. <clears throat> but this is not the aspect of Vedanta that is really, really essential for self-knowledge and moksha. Mm -hmm. There are some philosophical aspects that goes even to the realms of speculation and so on that I, I don't like to go much into that, but I, I, have, I have friends and students that love to explore that, you know. So for example, if we start really digging into the notion of uh, what Maya, what's the nature of Maya and how Maya you know, projects Ishwara Jivan Jagat, so when we start really trying to understand Maya, we go into, into a kind of, a, a kind of a, a <clears throat> analysis or investigation or inquiry that becomes philosophical because Maya is not logical for the human intellect. It's that which is absolutely impossible to comprehend. The difference is that our scriptures say that it does not go about say, okay, let's speculate. And then for, you know, although there are many, many Brahma Sutras, many books of Vedantas that speculate a lot on, on some theories, some ideas of why this, why that. But those are not really the teachings that are absolutely relevant for the gaining of this hard and fast knowledge in regards to what we are. You know, we don't need to know the motivations behind Maya. So Maya projects the three gunas, or Maya is the three gunas, but what has motivated Maya to bring forth these three energies, these three qualities, okay? And then we say Maya, but Maya is, is not separate from, from consciousness, from awareness. So is, is it part of awareness? No, it's not separate, but it's not really awareness. So when we start really looking to those aspects of Vedanta, it's so subtle. It's that the intellect, which is something that evolved in the macrocosm causal body of, you know, of the universe, or the, the microcosm uh, uh, subtle body of the jiva. You know? This intellect, which is an aspect of a subtle body, cannot really objectify the causal body, which is the cause of the subtle and, and the physical, the gross universe, the gross, gross body. You know? So we don't really know. And, and a lot of these, these stamps, the scriptures do not say much. They don't say much. You know? They just don't go there. There are no scriptures 
having, and the scriptures do not have answer for all the questions I hear again and again, that's why I'm saying, no, these scriptures do not say. And uh, so if it does not say, it means to say that we don't need to know. You know, we need to know who we are. It reminds me of Osho Rajanishi, you would say that there are three, three categories of, of things or phenomena or, or object. One is that, that uh, we say <clears throat> unknown, others are that which are not known, it's our ignorance, we don't know. We know what we know, we don't know what we don't know, and then there is a third category that is the unknowable, that which can never cannot ever be known by any human intellect. Why well, the human intellect is an effect of a certain cause. And the cause, every cause pervades its effects. And the effect has no means to object by the, its cause because the cause is, is much more subtle. You know? <clears throat> Scientific progress has drastically reduced the field of philosophical speculation so that it's now little more than a narrow room where very interesting, intricate arguments about the meanings of words are carried on without conclusion. So science and Vedanta, what is Vedanta? We often say Vedanta is a science. It's a means of knowledge, a scientific means of knowledge. No, that we, can, we can follow the logic and then if the, the individual is qualified, we're gonna have the same end result. It's like, okay, let's make an experiment. Da, 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 you apply, oh yes, I got it. I see, I got the vision. Now I, I see, how could I have missed it? So if it, that is done, applied, and again and again, we have the same results. So we are just dealing with something that can be scientifically proved. It's the science of consciousness, or the science of reality, howsoever we want to put it. <clears throat> Vedanta is sometimes referred to as a philosophy, but this is not really so. The abstract nature of some of the topics of Vedanta, such as Maya, makes it somehow philosophical at times. But if we examine the teaching carefully, we will always find some supporting logic behind it. Most of the time, even when it gets very, very subtle. No? There is a, a question came up in a group in Brazil. Somebody brought the question about, uh, about the Nature, the nature of, uh, <clears throat> of Satya Guna. You say, so we know that Ishwara is the intelligent, it's intelligent cause, it's the energetic cause, it's the material cause, cause, and it's the universe manifest yeah, as Jagat. So we know that Jagat changes. We know that different aspects of Ishwara may change, may not change. But how about Satya? So sattva, sattva guna, the energy, which sometimes we say the Ishwara is fundamentally is pure sattva, no? pure sattva, the knowledge, the intelligence no? from which the universe exists in potential and sometimes manifests as the material physical universe that we, we know. No? So this intelligent cause that we call Ishwara, no? sattva, you are such one. No? Is it a changing, a changing phenomenon or unchanging phenomenon? So this question developed, and uh, because below the line of Maya, it seems that everything changed. Everything changed. No? But everything in Maya is constant change. But how about this intelligent cause? Is something subject to change or not? So it was a very intriguing, intriguing question, and I had to think about it. And then I, I, I sent an email to Ramji, and he came back with, with a question, an answer that it was beautiful, profound, but it's still like yes and no. So we, we don't, you know, <clears throat> that's just to, just to illustrate the fact that uh, we can always find some aspects, some questions, some inquiries that can be very abstract by, by nature, you know, because we are dealing with something that is the cause.
No, Vedanta is more like a science, the science of consciousness. The Sanskrit, this is nice, the Sanskrit word that is frequently translated as philosophy is darshan. From the times of Osho, our satsangs we were used to be called darshan. Oh, there is darshan today, there is no, we did not call it satsang. <clears throat> That's interesting. So in Sanskrit, this word darshan, darshan is, uh, it means philosophy, okay? Which means, you know, darshan was translated in English as philosophy, which in truth, darshan in Sanskrit means vision. This is very interesting. Darshan is vision, which means vision, the correct vision of reality. So Vedanta is such as development of a vision. And in order to have that kind of vision, we need to submit our minds so that we can see things as they are, as they, they were designed to be, you know? I mean, we see duality, we see plurality, we see, you know, all these opposite things, you know, in duality. But when we really follow the logic of Vedanta, gradually we develop the vision and then we start understanding. We have this wisdom, the vision of wisdom, the third eye or whatsoever we want to put it. The sixth sense, you know. So, and then we, we got the vision, and this vision is the vision of Vedanta, which is called Darshan. Philosophy. So some people think Vedanta is a philosophy, but Vedanta is a, is a vision. It's more like with reference to Vedanta, this vision is equal to direct self-knowledge. What is this vision? It's direct self-knowledge, so understanding. Because in order to have a, a vision, you have to have a, a knower, a means of knowledge, an object of, of knowledge. Huh? So and then we can have a vision. So in order for this vision to be a proper, correct vision, yeah, we have to, to submit. We need to conform our minds yeah, to this means of knowledge so that gradually we see things as they are. Okay, we see reality as they are, as it is. That's the point here. But though, with reference to Vedanta, this vision is equal to direct self-knowledge. The doubtless knowledge. Direct self-knowledge is the knowledge in reference to one's true nature, one's real nature, one's real fundamental primary nature. This is self-knowledge. It's not something other than myself. Oh, now I know what or who I am. What I am is better. I know what I am. I am consciousness. I am limitless, free, unconcerned consciousness, and so on. So this knowledge is, is what we call, with reference to Vedanta, this vision is equal to direct self-knowledge. A doubtless knowledge, or the doubtless knowledge, I am pure, limitless consciousness. So Vedanta presents it as vision because it is the perspective from where reality is seen as it is. So what is this vision? This vision is easily defined as all there is is consciousness. And if all there is is consciousness, I must be consciousness as well because I cannot exclude myself from all there is because all there is means all, right? So the vision of Vedanta is nothing but all there is is consciousness and I am that. That's the point. All there is consciousness alone. Get to this vision and to get to this vision, it takes some time because the ignorance is hardwired as we know. Well, it keeps extroverting our mind and the belief that reality is duality, believe that the objects is just can supply a, a resolution, yeah? it can resolve my, my personal problem of you know, dissatisfaction and, and so on. So all these, these things are going to be coming up because the ignorance is, is very old. It has been forever here. It's, Therefore, this vision requires some work, as we know, okay, until it's really 
a doubtless knowledge is a certainty, full conviction, knowledge which is filled with certainty. It's a certainty of knowledge. Knowledge uh, with no doubt in, in respect to what I am. Yeah? So when this knowledge is like that, Ranji likes to call it a hard and fast knowledge. A knowledge fast that soul is present with you. You don't need to stop everything, go back, run to your videos, run to your books, and then start looking at your notes to say, no, no, now it's okay. Now I can deal with this problem here. Because uh, now I, I remember, I, I, I'm never affected by anything that happens. You know, uh, my experience do not affect me. Now I remember, I look, no, it's fast, it's immediate, it's always available. This, this knowledge is clear, firm, it's present, it's hard and fast, all is available. So this is what is a direct self-knowledge. And this is, the, <clears throat> this is the vision. The vision comes from this. Actually from where this knowledge is working for us. You know? But those who have this vision, this vision is the absolute truth. For those who have this vision, this vision is absolute truth, not philosophy or academic knowledge. So when the knowledge is a doubtless knowledge, and then this knowledge, <clears throat> this vision, this understand, you know, it, it really fructifies. It really, one can really appreciate, you know, one's true fundamental free nature because one has no doubt anymore. If we, every time, if we keep shifting back and forth, I say, okay, now I'm clear, I know I am consciousness and nothing can touch me. And then if next moment I shift back and I say, oh no, my God, I am my body and my body got sick and I don't like it. Oh, I, I got a few more wrinkles here, you know, and so on. And I cannot accept that, you know. Oh, I lost more hairs and so on. Oh, my hair's got white. <clears throat> so if we have all these concerns operating in our mind, it means we are shifting back and forth. We are not firm with the understand that I am just that which cannot, which does not change with any experience. And I'm not the body. I'm not the mind. I'm the light behind the mind. I'm the light shining in the mind and the body. So if this knowledge is not hard and fast, it, it keeps being present now and then forgotten afterward. Present now, forgotten afterward. Those who have this vision, this vision is absolute truth. It's not a question of academic knowledge. It's not a question of you know, theory and practice. It's just the truth. And then once we have this certainty of knowledge, you have no problem to deal with Vasanas when they are coming from from your ignorant past, because uh, you you just and then and only then you can say doesn't matter I'm not my vasana, and I'm not going to allow this vasana to push me around, okay? Because I know that I am learning. That that is a voice from my past when I was living in ignorance and those those impressions, those those residual, those those vasanas they are still in my system and they keep coming up, but my certainty of knowledge, conviction of knowledge such that I, mean, I can deal easily with, uh, with vasanas that contradict my self-knowledge. <clears throat> so this is nice. For those who have this vision, this vision is absolute truth. It's not philosophy nor academic knowledge. And then it says, this truth, the truth <coughs> regarding our true fundamental nature, this truth can be supported by logic, but it cannot be deduced by logic. So when we have this self now we use a lot of logic. The logic, the Dante is presented to us by logic, by sentence, by words, you know, following a logic which is logic based on our experience. When this logic is presented to us, it's going to gradually neutralize or, or destroy or remove all the wrong, wrong notions we have about what we are. 
we have strong notions about what we are. We believe that we are changed, we are bound by time, we have this, we are sick, we are getting old. Huh? So all those notions, as we keep working this knowledge in our minds consistently, constantly, daily, systematically, with the help of someone who can help if help is needed. And then as we do the work, we are just knocking off, we are just removing all those ignorance that were just crowding my, my mind, the way I think and feel, you know. So by doing that, I'm using logic, but the moment that I have self-knowledge, you know, this knowledge cannot, is, is, not, is no longer a function of anyone I mean, my self-knowledge does not depend on any of this knowledge. The knowledge was only a tool to remove ignorance. Self-knowledge is so direct, it's so immediate, it's so self-evident. It's like, oh my God, you know? I am existing as a conscious, limitless principle, for lack of a better word, forever. Since I was born, I remember this light shine. Okay, so do I need any logic for that? No, I don't. I need the logic to remove the ignorance. I need the logic to neutralize all those crazy ideas. Everybody, since we are a small child, is feeding us with ignorance. Everybody saying, you are the body, look how beautiful, look how ugly, da, da, da. you know? You have to secure, you have to do this, you have to be someone. You are, you are this body. <clears throat> so this truth cannot can be supported by logic, but it cannot be deduced by logic. For self knowledge is not a, an objective knowledge; it's not based on perception and inference. Self knowledge is not based on perception and inference. Okay, self knowledge is a direct, immediate knowledge in respect to what I have always been. I will always be just the light of consciousness shining in every creature, in every human being, in every animal, in ever, even in the, in the inert objects, there is consciousness always there. So the four qualifications for understanding the words of Vedanta are about to be detailed in the following verse. But it should be understood that these qualifications come to us from those teachers who know the self. In other words, these qualifications are not arbitrary, not the product of individual insight or speculation. By common sense and observation, they have been universally prescribed from time immemorial as indispensable for attaining moksha. So having understood that, so what is the problem? What is the problem about working to develop qualifications? People have a huge problem with accepting and, and say, okay, so why not to enjoy the process? Why not to enjoy the process to, to be a spiritual, religious being working for one's spiritual elevation? Life is about spiritual elevation, even after Self-knowledge, in a way, self-knowledge is the beginning, you know, of somehow a different, a new chapter in one's spiritual progress, spiritual elevation. You know? So the point is to enjoy the process as a Kami Yogi and forget about this, this time frame thing that when I'm going to get it, when I, you know, so let's enjoy developing these qualifications. And meanwhile, you just keep doing your yin yoga as well. You keep discriminating as well, satya from mitya, you from all the object, consciousness from your mind. Those are very subtle discriminations, but they should be. They can be done, you know. <clears throat> they, they better be done. Vedanta is not philosophy because it's not spec speculative, but certain, but it's a certain precise knowledge. It's not mysticism, 
There is nothing mysterious, vague or abstract about Vedanta. But Vedanta scriptures state that Maya is, is not compared, I covered that already. Vedanta vision is the result of direct knowledge. Am I repeating myself? No. Vedanta vision is the result of direct self-knowledge. Vedanta vision is the direct uh, the result of direct self-knowledge and personal experience. Vedanta vision is the result of direct knowledge and one's personal experience. It can be analyzed and proven universally to be universally true and is accessible to everyone with the necessary qualifications. So we can, we can really put it to the test and it becomes one's personal experience. The vision, this vision is a vision in respect to the way we see reality. And we see the reality through the manifest universe. We see the universe and say, oh, okay, now I understand. This is all the ocean appearing with so many different names and forms, you know, as if the entire ocean is made out of parts. But the ocean is a, is a whole, partless, it's a partless whole when we look at from the standpoint of the ocean. If we look from the standpoint of its fundamental nature, the ocean is but water. Water is the fundamental essential nature of the ocean. Yeah? So this Vedanta vision, vision is the result of direct self-knowledge, which brings about this personal experience. And it can be analyzed and proven universally through to its accessible and, and is accessible to everyone with the required qualifications. <clears throat> the words of Vedanta are the means. The end is self-knowledge. The end is self-knowledge and freedom, moksha. The words of Vedanta are the means and the result of a goal is moksha. Moksha, we say that is self-knowledge, to know the self. To know the self is to, is to go beyond, yeah? beyond knowledge and ignorance. Is to know that knowledge and ignorance is something that can be objectified by me, awareness. of Because I know what I know and I know what I do not know. I am that in which knowledge and ignorance as concepts just come into <clears throat> into my my vision, into my 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 light. Yeah? So the words of Vedanta, the means, the end is self knowledge and moksha. The means can only operate on one who has the fourfold qualification and the help of a teacher to unfold the words. All these elements must be present or self-knowledge or the knowledge of a true nature will not be realized. All these elements must be present, the scripture, a teacher, and an individual with certain qualifications. And then we have, we have to do a work knowing that we are, we are fit, we are a good candidate to, to be free. To understand this simple thing, this simple, simple no? fact. <laughs> it's a fact, but it's uh, it's somehow it's so subtle. <clears throat> so the verse, verse number nine. The four qualifications are, as we know, the number one is always up there is discrimination. The second is dispassion. And the third, the third is, uh, is discipline. So in some, uh, some of our books, our scriptures, we say that the qualifications are the four Ds. The four Ds no? Discrimination, discipline, and desire. Yeah? Desire is a bit strange. So, oh, desire. My own 
for the desire is the problem. Huh? Yeah, but this is altogether a different kind of desire. So this is the fourth D, which is desire, and it means desire for liberation, which is a very powerful desire. Oh, it's a good desire. We need this desire. This is desire that's going to consume. It's gradually going to consume all other desires. The other desires are desires for objects that bounds us in samsara. This desire is desire from freedom from object because I'm just desiring to know this subject, conscious principle, the knower, the true knower huh, of all objects. Discrimination, it's, uh, it's always heading the list of qualifications. In this advanced text, a qualified person must be able to distinguish what is eternal, satya, from what is time-bound, no? nitya. It's going to be a discrimination between the subject and the objects, and we know that the objects are all and everything that can be uh, all and anything that can be seen, perceived, known, okay? From, from something that we're going to understand gradually, that this something is not really the mind. Okay? But the mind cannot really know anything if it's not for consciousness, the knowing, revealing principle, the light that knows and reveals everything. It's consciousness alone that knows everything. It needs the mind, of course. So discrimination is this discrimination between such and media, between the subject and the object, between reality and unreality, the self and the not self. We can look at it using different terms, okay? But fundamentally, it's a discrimination between the subject and the object. And we say that the subject is real because it's that which never changes and it's always ever present. In all objects, those, that, those factors that can always be objectified and perceived, seen and known, all those objects, they are bound by time, and they change. They are in continuous flux of change. They are bound by time. They begin and they end. Okay? And even the universe has a beginning and an end. We know, scientifically, we know. So objects is anything that can come into the scope of my conscious awareness and say, yes, I know. So are my emotions? The subject and object, of course, my emotions are objects. They are very subtle object. I, am I identified with my emotions? No. Oh, we are. A lot of the time we identify with my emotions, our emotions. Huh? Somebody offends us, just, oh, you really, you hurt my feelings, huh? like Ranji likes to say. My feelings, I'm hurt, my feelings. You don't say my feelings I hurt. You hurt me, huh? Because I'm identified with my emotions, I'm identified with my notions, I'm identified with so many of those aspects of even my intellect. So those are all objects. So discriminating the light of consciousness from the mind and its experience is a very, very subtle discrimination. So when we say, when we come to, to this text and we say that the most important qualification is discrimination, the most fundamental qualification is, is discrimination. It refers to the discrimination between subject and object, such and media, reality and reality. Okay? But this is, this is very subtle. It's, uh, it's, it's important for us to understand that this ability to discriminate is something that we all have and we exercise this all the time. Every human being is using his or her intellect to discriminate you know, 
among the object of experience. Jesus I want, Jesus I don't like, Jesus I don't care. Oh no, Jesus I really want. You know, Jesus I like, that I don't like. So we, we use our discrimination all the time, but we use our discrimination at, at the service, at serve, serving our vasanas, our likes and dislikes, our raga diversions. So is, there is a way to exercise this discrimination, to refine this qualification, this, this power, uh, this faculty of discrimination, which, which is uh, an exercise which is intermediary between discrimination between touch and media and the discrimination between the objects of my likes and dislikes. So this in between the stage, which is fundamental to refine this faculty, is the between Dharma and the Dharma. <coughs> No, this discriminated between, you know, I mean, what is the best response here so that I can, I can contribute to the field and contribute to my mental stability, purification, and stabilization, and, and clarity, and focus, and so on. So we want to develop this qualification so that we have this faculty of discrimination so subtle, so refined, that I can discriminate between such and media on a more base. The best way to go about that is beginning discriminating among what is good for my spiritual elevation and what is not good, what is dharmic, what is something of the benefit of the overall field, you know, what is the best thing for, for the people not for myself, what is the right thing to do, what is the fair thing to do, what is the most just thing to do in this case. So to again and again discriminate between Dharma and Dharma is the best exercise to refine our faculty of discrimination. Okay? <clears throat> but if the mind is very subtle, is very refined, we can just keep doing this discrimination between Satya and Mitya. And we can do it at the simultaneous, I mean, we can do both yogas, you know? So we can do both. So we just keep refusing, negating, you know? rejecting anything that changes. Is there anything more simple, simpler than that? You just have to remember, no, this is something that changes. I am that which is not subject to change. That which is not bound by time. So anything that's bound by time is just an object, and therefore you don't want to get caught up, attached, entangled, you know, identified with, and so on. And of course, that begins with our our body mind complex. The moment that we identify with the medium, our medium of knowledge, our medium of experience, and then we we start getting really agitated, you know? We really get affected. Why? <clears throat> because I feel small, I feel limited, you know? I feel full of defects and flaws. And because there is no perfection in each there is no body mind that is perfect. It's impossible to achieve perfection. So if I that I'm the body mind, I, I know that I'm changing. Oh my God, I'm getting old. I was so beautiful 20 years ago, and look at me now. You know, big problem. So um, if I get attached to my emotions, my emotions, my ideas, they change. I get confused. I don't know who I am anymore. It's uh, discrimination. We can do this discrimination. So if it changes, forget it. I just reject getting involved, getting entangled, getting excited with anything that is constantly changing. Why? Because I need to reject everything that changes so that I can isolate this principle, which is my real nature that is changeless, so that when I really when I really undo this confusion, and then once I have isolated clearly this unchanging principle, only then I can claim 
my identity as this conscious existence principle that we does not change. But if it's still confused with what changes, okay, and then I may try to claim, but I'm claiming I am consciousness, but my my identity as consciousness is mixed up, confused with my identity as the body-mind complex. As my experience, fundamentally, this discrimination and discriminating consciousness from the mind and its experience. Now, <clears throat> are we not identified with our experience? Every time we have to say something about us, we talk about our experience, our our histories, what we did, what we did not do, how I felt in that, you know, this is, this is our resume, this is our, our profile, this is what I am, my experience. You know? So <clears throat> if we understand that uh, I'm not my experience, experience is an object. Experience itself is an object. You understand? Why? Because easily see it as something other than myself. I am the knower of any and all experience. Okay? Any and all experience, I am the knower. There is something. Yeah? And the background of any and all experience is this non-subject principle. So if I can separate, discriminate myself from all experience, and then I can easily isolate myself and say, okay, this is what I am. I'm the light that reveals the world of experience. And then my body mind construct can have an experience. And sometimes he's going to say, oh, I like. Sometimes he's going to say, oh, I don't like. But I am the light. So this discrimination is a, is a very, very subtle, you know, which is very simple because there is nothing simpler than discriminating that which changes from that which does not change. So, but being simple does not mean that it's easy. Why? Because it's extremely subtle. And ignorance, again, is again and again tricking us, deceiving us making us get again and again confused with what changed. Hence, it's opportune to mention that the development of disqualification, discrimination between such and Nietzsche begins with the exercise of a lower level of discrimination, the discrimination between Dharma and the Dharma. That is when we say, yes, Arjuna, be a Kami Yoga after Krishna have tried to help Arjuna in the chapter two, and then he says, no, it's, it's be a Kami Yoga, do Kami Yoga, you know, Kami Yoga is superior, action is better for you. Just do actions from a certain standpoint of knowledge, understanding, and attitude, because that kind of knowledge is going to prepare your mind for moksha, therefore be a yogi. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, very subtle, and therefore it requires a subtle mind. <clears throat> we need to begin with a denser level of discrimination so that we can get to the very subtle level, at least until we gain a very subtle mind. <clears throat> but going back to our satyamitya discrimination, it's not difficult to tell what's time bound. Everything we experience, every object is time bound. As for the eternal, if we knew it was the self, we would not be here, not need Vedanta. Huh? what is eternal. So we know because we heard from the scriptures that eternal is the self, but we still somehow, we are, we incline to believe that the self is something other than the very light that illumines my mind. 
So if we would really know that ah, I am the self, Aham Brahman is me, I would not need Vedanta at this point. So it's this confusion, this misunderstanding. Yeah? For the eternal, if we knew it as the self, we would have no need for Vedanta. So discrimination is concerned with objectifying that which is transient, that which comes and goes. It's a process of negation of all that change, all that's time bound. So the other qualification, the second D, is dispassion. Dispassion is the logical consequence of discrimination. So what is dispassion? When we begin discriminating the self, consciousness, you know, the subject from the object, why are we are going to discriminate the self from the not self? Yeah? Consciousness from the objects that appears we see the scope of consciousness. Why? <laughs> because we understood that objects, you know, they are the fact by nature. They are by nature. That objects are value neutral. So this is an advanced text, Michael, for you. So at this point, we understood already that every object is limited by nature and we, we have a huge problem is because we, we superimpose values on object. Our subject projection, our subject ideas or notions that a certain object has values that are not inher inherent to the object. So when we come to this, this level of discrimination is because we understood that values are limited. They cannot really provide us with what we are really seeking. We are really searching. What are we are searching? We are searching freedom from the sense of limitation, inadequacy, insufficiency, and so on. I want to feel free from all this, you know, this limiting self, you know, limiting self, insulting notions and ideas that I hold against myself. I want to be free from this. I want to feel good. You know? So in order for, for us to, to do that, we need to understand that all objects, howsoever shiny, howsoever attractive it may be, it's still limited and nothing will ever really provide me with this sense of freedom and limitlessness that is my goal. Because now I am a, a Vedantin. Now I want motion. So I understood. So it's a logical consequence of discrimination, this passion. Because in order for me to discriminate between objects and subjects, I have understood already that objects, they don't have intrinsic value. They have relative value, let's put it. They don't have any absolute value. I superimpose, I project values that are not really, do not really belong. Nobody will ever find an object that's going to give limitless satisfaction and freedom. There is no such a thing. We know that. We have gone from object to object and they all fail to give us this sense of, of freedom that we are seeking. So when we understand what is real and what is unreal, we naturally become dispassionate towards what is unreal. We understood what is reality, what is always good, what is always present, what is not bound by time and space. Okay? So we, once we understood that, and we understand that everything that before I was running to chase and running to avoid the world of objects, Oh, everything else is just is just deprived of true value, you know. When I understand that naturally, I become dispassionate towards objects. So this dispassion is only possible to the degree that uh, we develop wisdom, understanding, knowledge. Only then we can really say, okay, now I feel my dispassion is growing. 
how did you do that? Oh, I'm repeating a mantra. I am dispassionate, I am dispassionate. No, it's not going to do. No, this kind of uh, hypnosis is not going to help. I need to really understand what I can gain for certain objects and what I cannot gain for the object and the free, the kind of freedom we are looking for, the kind of satisfaction we are looking for will never be provided by any object. So therefore I develop this, this passion, which is a natural consequence of my wisdom, I understood. I become dispassionate towards what is unreal. When we watch a dramatic movie, for example, at the cinema, we don't get excited and concerned about what's happening on the screen, right? We are watching a movie. We don't get all agitated and, and so on. I mean, we are not involved because we know it's not really real. I mean, sometimes we get a little bit involved because we like the actor, we take some side on, you know, <clears throat> to the players. In general, we don't get excited and concerned because we know that it's not real. We just watch it with a relaxed and cool indifference. We watch it relax with a relaxed and cool indifference because we are not really invested in the story. We are not really invested in the story. So how about the story of my life? Am I invested in the story of my life? Do I see this Jiva acting no. No. early in the morning until late in the evening? Do, am I invested in this Jiva? Do I see this Jiva as something real? Or I see this Jiva as an object, you know, that appears very close, very dear to me, you know, I, it's the, the means, it's, it's the, the medium yeah, by which I can, I can see the world. I consciousness, I mean. <clears throat> when we watch, yeah, this passion is experience, is experience so red time. <clears throat> okay, let's stop here, this passion. And uh, anybody has any question? Any complaints? Uh, yes. Complaints? I, <clears throat> you say that, yes, uh, we cannot uh, objectify consciousness, but we can see it, or I'm, I'm a little bit confused about that. No, I, I say that, uh, I did not say that we can see, I mean, there is a, there is a, so there is a certain experiential element to self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. Experiential element to self-knowledge, is a, is a very simple thing. With self-knowledge, the mind tends to, to develop a natural predominance of Sattva Guna. When the mind is resolved by the means of self-knowledge, the mind is no longer agitated and depressed because of wanting to gain or wanting to avoid things, the frustrations of life. The mind is resolved most of the time. So in that condition, there is, yeah. there, there is a very nice, let me mute our friend. In that, in that condition, there is a very nice feel of this. It's, it's commonly known in the, in the kind of spiritual circle as a feeling of presence, okay? This feeling of presence is nothing but consciousness reflecting in a, in a in a satavic mind, a mind resolved by, by knowledge. So there is this, you, you can feel that you are the light because the light is reflecting in the subtle body all the time. Light is reflecting all the time, you know? And the, the only thing is most people do not see the light because the light gets caught up with the object. You know this teaching, you look at my hand, what do you see here? You see my hand. Yeah? And then I put this mouse, I ask you, what do you see now? I see the hand and the mouse. Yeah? And then I would say, there is something you are missing. What you are missing here, Claudia? Mm, 
the light reflecting. <laughs> You're missing the light. We just we just count the light because the light illumines and reveals everything out there, and then we just get caught up. But if the mind is very subtle and if one develops this spiritual vasana to stay put with this clear reflection of consciousness in a sattvic mind, and then there is a nice feel to it, you know, a feel of presence, presence as consciousness. You know, you know it's. It's I consciousness reflecting on his mind now. <clears throat> but I think there was another passage there that made this confusion to, it, to you, that brought up this doubt in you. But we don't have much time right now, Joe. You, you can remind me next class. Okay, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? We'll huh? take time to understand. <laughs> yeah. So it's important that we develop the understanding that self-knowledge is all about knowledge. It's all about knowledge. Okay, it's the knowledge of your true, real, fundamental, free, <coughs> independent nature. Okay, this is knowledge. But the thing is that the, the 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 bonus that comes with this knowledge is that your experience with the world is completely changed. Okay. Not change in a way that now you're going to, to have a different realm or dimension of uh, ecstatic experience. No, it experience, your experience of the world change because you see the world first as something that's not really real. And second, no longer you see the world as the only supply of happiness or, or source of, of happiness. You, you know your happiness is not in the world, your happiness is in yourself. So therefore you relate to the world from a totally different angle and that is a very nice way to live one's life. <clears throat> okay. Punamada Punamidam Punapunamudachate Punatya, Punamadaya, Punameva Vashishate, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, everybody. We meet again, Ishwara Willing, next, uh, next Thursday morning. For, for I mean, everybody is invited to join us on our meetings in Carbondale. It is 4 p.m. in European time, our European time, and 3 p.m. for Marx. For Marx. And uh, okay. so we meet this coming Thursday, and we meet again next week. And uh, good Merry Christmas to everybody. Hey, thank you, Arlinda. You too. God bless. Ciao. Uh,